This is Drumwise Meets, and today I'm here with a drummer who's worked with the likes of David Bowie, Bruce Springsteen, Billy Joel, the B-52s, and Gwen Stefani, Zach Alford. Hi, Zach. Hey, how you doing? age did you get into drums and when you first started what music inspired you um get into i would say was probably 10. um i got my first kit at 11 so that's when i really started to play but at 10 i used to go to um my older brother's friend's house and he had a drum kit and that was my Actually, it wasn't my first time ever being close to a drum kit, but it was my first time being able to sit behind one. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just, every chance I got, I, I took advantage of it. I don't remember how many times I did it, but I must have done it a few times because I felt like I learned how to play basically on that kit. And when I say learned how to play, I just mean as a 10 year old kid being able to play a beat. I wasn't, you know, I didn't have an extensive vocabulary or anything yet, but but I felt like I could sit behind a drum set and play. Uh, the music I got into at that time, um, obviously at 10, you're already listening to a lot of stuff. So I grew up, again, I had an older brother, so there was his music that pretty much uh, was around the house. Uh, we had albums from the Stones, the Beatles, um, Led Zeppelin, um, Janis Joplin, uh, records that my father gave me, um, Elton John's greatest hits. Uh, but then there was also the stuff that was on the radio. So it was a lot of uh, R&B and pop. So you had on WABC, you had everything from Queen to Hall and Oates to um, Elton John uh to the eagles to um beatles of course and pink floyd and then there was also um sly stone the jackson five um and this is before disco so the disco craze hadn't really started yet so you know james brown um so it's all music that was just percolating in the neighborhood. You could walk through this, around the streets and hear music coming out of people's windows. Um, we didn't have MTV yet. Uh, so it was pretty much radio records and whatever you heard walking around. But I really listened mostly to Zeppelin um, in those early days, uh, Beatles, uh, Parliament, Funkadelic, um, Marvin Gaye, uh, you know, these were the things I was actually listening to and checking out the drums. Mm. Yeah, that's kind of, that's what, where I'm going with that question, really. You just hit the nail on my head there. Like, yeah, because when we, when we first start listening to music, we may not be listening to the drums, but then all of a sudden I think we're like, hang on, what's this magical thing I'm hearing? <laughs> I know that was, mm -hmm. that was, it was like that for me. Um, and, um, and when you first started, what was your first drum set? Um, so at 11 years old, I went down to 48th Street with my mom and we picked out a drum kit. We went into Sam Ash and it was a 1970s Gretsch maple uh, five piece drum kit, 14 inch uh, snare, 14 inch floor tom, 12 and 13 inch toms and 22 inch uh no sorry 20 inch bass drum hmm. awesome what finish yeah. was it can you remember maple it was a maple finish. oh it was just oh i see so, okay oh nice well my next part to the question is have you still got it uh 
I have most of it. Some of it has gotten away over the years, just, you know, tumultuous New York City life and moving from houses to house and up into the country eventually, you know, stuff. Also letting people borrow things, changing music studios, it's just, you know, this, and basically not being on top of it, not realizing that you got to really look after everything. So I replaced the floor tom with a 16 inch tom, uh, probably in my early twenties because I wanted a deeper sound and I don't know where the 14 inch tom went. Mm. It's still good that you've got some of it. I've got none of my first stuff at all. It's just- Well, know. I don't have the snare either. The snare actually wasn't Gretsch. We had bought a Slingerland snare drum. Oh, and God. that also, um, I have no idea where that lies at this point, but- uh, <laughs> It's out there somewhere, living a new life. <laughs> So um, hopefully getting some love. <laughs> exactly. And while we're talking about equipment, um, you know, when the world is a bit more of a normal place and we're able to, uh, to tour and, and record and so on, um, what equipment uh, do you currently use? Well, after I had that kit, um, it had Slingerland hardware. And as I say, a Slingerland, uh, Slingerland snare. And there was just something about it that wasn't uh, impressive, I have to say, because someone said to me once, and that someone is a bass player named Yossi Fine. He said, man, you need to get yourself a new drum kit. As soon as you get a new drum kit, you'll start getting more gigs. And so I went on the search for a drum set and I happened to know Omar Hakim's brother, Kabit. And Kabit said, hey, well, Omar is selling his kit. And uh, I said, perfect. So I went to Omar's house in Queens, you know, sat down, just took, took my foot, stomped down on the kick drum. That one kick drum hit just made me go, oh man, I want this kit. Because it was a 22 inch. So it just had a different sound from the 20 inch that I was used to. Mm -hmm. And um, it had all uh, Pearl hardware, I believe. Uh, but it was a Gretsch kit as well. So that was my first kind of pro kit. And uh, what I use now though is Yamaha because uh, I was spotted by a Yamaha A&R rep and he offered me an endorsement back in 1990. And so that's all I've been using ever since. Mm. Awesome. And someone else um, that I interviewed a little while back and we got talking about Yamaha drums, one of my first drum kits was the Yamaha Club Custom, like the early 90s Club Custom. And I don't know if you, you've ever played on one of those, but what a kit. That's one of those kits that I wish I'd kept. It was just mm. fantastic. It's so nice. I think it was mahogany, but it was it a was beautiful kit. You know, I haven't tried those. I've tried a bunch of other ones. Um, usually what they give me. <laughs> yeah. So I started on the Rock Tour Custom. Mm. And that was uh, actually 1990, so probably around the same time. Uh, but then I switched over to Maple Custom and used that for many years. Mm. Awesome. Uh, I've also tried the Birch, um, Oak, um, Hybrid. Yeah, and right now I'm uh, very happy settling in on the Recording Customs, mm. which are actually some of the first that I ever uh, saw in the catalogs mm. back in the 80s. Yeah, well, it's yeah, like legendary, legendary kits. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> now, um, disclaimer here, I would find this question hard to answer, but here we go. Um, if you had to pick just one, who would be your all time favorite drummer? Uh, God, that is so hard. And if you can't answer it, then, you know, just give me a list of like the biggest influences. <laughs> okay, I would have to say probably all time favorite slash biggest influence with a disclaimer to all the other huge influences on me um, would be Charlie Drayton. Mm. Uh, 
he's not the most well-known drummer in the world, but he's uh, looms large in my world and the world that I came up in and a lot of people who uh, were around me playing. Uh, Charlie, I got to see when I was 15 years old um, in a club called Seventh Avenue South in New York City. And he was playing with a band called the Floyd Boys, which was a kind of R&B, funk, fusion-y uh, outfit. And you know, a lot of people don't realize that that's where Charlie comes from because they mostly know him from playing with Keith Richards in the Expensive Winos or playing with Fiona Apple or playing with Paul Simon. But back in the day, he was a straight up funk drummer, straight up pocket, you know, just like sick funk drummer. And his whole thing was super minimalism. And so that kind of defined uh, the direction that I would take because I was listening to Fusion at the time. Um, but as I said, I had a solid bass in pop and R&B and, you know, classics like that. But at the time I was discovering Fusion and getting into Fusion and, and uh, when I saw Charlie play, he was so minimal that it just kind of pulled me back into being the anchor and the whole less is more concept. Uh, the other thing I'd like to say about that is um, when I saw Charlie, I was 15, but it's important to note that he was also 15. And he'd already been on the road with Shaka Khan and, uh, you know, playing with all these insane, incredible musicians, Marcus Miller, uh, Bernard Wright, uh, Hiram Bullock. And so he was a seasoned professional already. Uh, but for me at 15, I was just starting to play out in the clubs and, um, you know, just getting my feet wet, really. So he was a huge influence uh, because of the close proximity and also because stylistically, I just really, uh, what he did spoke to me. Excellent. And um, I, I know that was a difficult one to find just one. So give us a few um, other, you know, names that have really influenced you, um, you know, and, and the way that you play today. Well, John Bonham, uh, obviously, um, because I was hugely into Zeppelin. Um, uh, Steve Ferroni and um, Jerome Braley from Parliament Funkadelic was a huge influence. Uh, the first time I saw P Funk, however, Jerome was not playing, unfortunately, but Dennis Chambers was. And so I became a huge Dennis Chambers fan at that same time as well. Um, other drummers who I have to really say are really important to me are Ringo, uh, Steve Gadd, um, and uh, let's see. Um, later in life, I, I gravitated more toward people like uh, Clyde Stubblefield. Mm -hmm. You know, in the 80s, I wasn't so into sounding like that, like a old school R&B drummer because in those years, I didn't want to sound old school at all. Um, the 80s had a lot of drum programming entering into pop music, kind of reshaping pop music. And, um, and that's where my head was at. I wanted to sound more like a machine and sound modern and if anything, sound futuristic. Um, but Clyde Stubblefield now is absolutely uh, someone that I hold in just the highest regard as far as being a definitive and innovative drum pioneer. Um, yeah. That's a that's pretty good a, list. Yeah, that's a great Off the top of my head. That's great. And, you know, I, some with some of these interviews, I've been starting that question with, I believe that we evolve as drummers and take on different influences as we grow. And I've kind of dropped that because I feel the question's really long, but I still believe 
very much in that sentence you know and your answer was was perfect because you know yeah you you start by liking this guy and then as you get a bit better and you listen to more music you're like oh but there's there's all these guys and you know 30 years on or whatever you've got so many more influences it's not it's not something that you just have one and that's it is it so right right no and then you know um the the art form itself evolves and now you've got uh a whole slew of gospel drummers who you know they weren't even around until basically after the 2000s so so for for 30 years i wasn't listening to any of those guys i mean i had listened to some clark sisters uh but it wasn't about chops yet uh it was about feel and you know they were great um but when the whole gospel drumming craze took over, you know, that immediately got me really uh, excited again and interested in actually going back and, and practicing and, you know, delving deeper into my craft because all of a sudden it was like, I didn't even know that it was possible. <laughs> and, you know, um, it just really, really, uh, breathed life into into drumming for me again and just made me want to to explore and and address my own technique and and find new ways of exp of expressing myself on the kit and um from from one question which i think is is a tough one to another one which is is fairly hard for some people we'll see how this goes so What's been the highlight of your career so far? Well, that's actually a really easy question for me. Cool. Um, and that would be my two and a half years on the road with David Bowie. Uh, on the road and in the studio. They were just, uh, it was a fantastic time. Uh, it was the 90s, so the music industry was still, you know, going full throttle. Um, David was in an incredibly creative period of his life. Uh, he was clean and sober, so he was super focused. He was, he was super there as a person. Um, just so stimulating and inspiring to be around. Uh, so much fun. And the music was um, some of the most incredible music that you know, I could ever hope to play. And uh, the band was also a good balance because, you know, there's so many factors in music and a lot of it has to do with uh, who you actually have to spend your days with. You know, if there are people that are supportive, if there are people that you jive with personality-wise, conceptually. Um, so, we had a group of individuals who just all really dug not only being together, but through David, we were inspired to stretch and grow and explore so many different, different things, you know, as if it had, you know, anything in the arts. So that had to do with painting, sculpture, theater, uh, cinema, uh, literature, you know, we were just, expanding all through pretty much David because he was such a wellspring of all that stuff that, you know, for us, it, we were just sponges. Um, and, uh, and again, we just really enjoyed each other's company and, uh, and we were playing amazing music. It was a great time. He was the kind of performer who didn't micromanage. So playing for him was, total freedom hmm. he really let you do whatever you did and uh if it worked great if it didn't work you know you had to live with that didn't even bother him <laughs> you know unless it was like a really really horrific i can't imagine what it would be but you know if it if it really uh damage the performance in some way, he might be concerned, but otherwise you, you could have the worst night of the tour and he wouldn't even hardly notice. Mm. He, he, he really just let things be. And that's what was so uh, 
um, liberating about playing with him is you, you just felt comfortable. You felt you could uh, be yourself. Cool. Uh, yeah, that's, that's really important because I've done tours in the past or, or worked with people in the past where afterwards I've felt like mm, that wasn't the most enjoyable experience. And I think what you were saying- Absolutely, like, it can be a nightmare. Yeah, and it, I think that's so important. It's not, or I mean, obviously the music is the most important thing in terms of, you know, that, that's the product, isn't it? But yeah, you've got to enjoy and get on with the people that you're, uh, that you're spending every day with. Yeah. Um, definitely. Well, you know, I took it for granted because I actually had a long string of really, really great people to work with in that regard, in the regard of feeling comfortable, feeling valued. Uh, you know, the B-52s who really started me on the road to um, world touring uh, in, a, in, a, in a very high profile way were just total sweethearts and totally nurturing and at the same time, just all about having fun. Uh, then I worked with Springsteen after them and he again was probably, you know, the most respectful band leader uh, that, that you could ever want. I mean, he is the kind of guy where anything you needed, you had, mm. you know, if, if he thought that you, maybe he might try a new song when you got back to your hotel room, there was a blaster with, you know, a, a box set of all his music sitting there that someone, you know, had put in your room for you so that the next day you could show up totally prepared and everything you were just so well looked after on that tour mm. um and then of course you know bowie again it just felt uh i really took for granted that not every situation in the music industry is absolute bliss and fun yeah and what well, it's it's funny even just that you know the last uh, show i did back in march 2020 you know obviously here in the uk the virus was kind of here um we were that last show we were sort of joking about it and saying oh you know this this is probably this might be our last one for a little while but you know we totally took that for granted because here yeah. we are you know nearly a year later and yeah still no shows so yeah it's i think that's that's important as well isn't it when you're in that moment to you know really um take just take it all in and uh, enjoy it uh, a question here about um getting uh, a new gig and and learning the material so when you first get a gig with a new artist how do you learn the material so do you just listen um, do you listen and transcribe or has it ever happened where someone goes, here you go, Zach, here's a, a book here with all of the dots written down. Just, just learn all of that. Here you go. How's it worked for you? Um, when I went to Berkeley in the eighties, uh, everything was charts like that. So whenever you would either go to ensemble class or if you were doing a gig with your schoolmates outside of class, it was always charts. Uh, but the world I entered really didn't rely on charts after college. So um, I pretty much stopped using charts and stopped reading. So you can imagine my reading is not that great these days, but I devised my own system. And uh, it's a kind of a, a list. I draw, uh, I, I write out a list of all the sections of the song, how many bars they are. If there's a drum figure, I'll write the figure in with the notation, but just kind of as a reference. And um, that's the system I've used for, for years. Um, so that means you're listening to the song and mapping it out on a list. Okay, the, you know, it starts off with a synth. It starts off with a drum fill. It starts off with whatever. Uh, and then there's an intro, and then that's how many bars, you know, then there's what's the first section to start with the chorus, does it go into the verse? So I just, I just map it out on paper that way. Um, and I like to do that first because that puts a mental image in my head that I can always uh, refer to, and it means I learn the song quicker. Then I try and play along with it. Um, because for me anyway, 
my body doesn't like to do what my brain knows it should do. So uh, it takes my body a long time to, to say, oh, this is where that fill goes. And oh, okay, this beat changes to that. And I have to use this hand instead. You know, there's all kinds of little physical muscle memory that are not memory yet that you have to make into memory because you want to get to the point where you're not even thinking and you're just doing. Uh, and so I played through it until I can pretty much get through it and play it the way I want. Um, and that may take several times um, because the, te the temptation is to stop and, and start over and stop and start over until you get it right. But you need to be able to go from beginning to end straight through uh, because that's what you're gonna have to do later. And the sooner you do that, the sooner you'll forge these kind of uh, uh, the pathway that you need to get through that song um, and play it right. Um, you know, I never developed that skill of the masters who can just put up uh, this, the chart and just play it perfectly straight through. That was not me. Uh, I, I, had to, I had to just, you know, hammer my way through it for, for days sometimes. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. And, um, and while we're on this subject, actually, um, a question I've just thought of, um, you know, so let's say you're in the studio and you're recording uh, an album for someone. Obviously, you know, you've recorded some, some incredible stuff for some incredible artists. But once have you ever been in a situation where once you've recorded it, you've kind of afterwards, you've had to like relearn it for, for a tour or whatever, because it wasn't what you imagined it was going to be, if you know what I mean. Well, absolutely, but it's not only that you have, you don't, that maybe it's changed, but even if it hasn't changed, you've pretty much played it once in the studio that day and then moved on. So your brain forgets, you know, you had to do, you had to learn another song for the next day, another song for the next day. By the time you finish the album, you don't even remember what you played on the first song. And if you've never performed it live, again, it's not really in your body. And so when you go to, to rehearse for the tour, you have to relearn everything. Now, unless you know, you're a band, for bands, it's totally different. They've already spent you know, months hammering these songs out and getting them under their belt. I don't have that luxury usually. Usually I'm coming in and learning a song that day or two songs or three songs that day and playing what will be the definitive version uh, then, and then you got to move on. And like I say, it just, it just, you know, your brain hits delete and makes room for the next, you know, uh, huge chore that you have to undertake. And uh, something I must mention here, uh, I did one of these interviews with Steve Ferroni and you mentioned him earlier. I asked him about recording Earth Song for Michael Jackson. Um, I mean, you know, what a song to, to be on. And um, we were talking about it. And then he said, um, oh, he said, yeah, I, I recorded another song that day, I think. I can't remember what it was, but I, I did record another one. I was just like, that's the way it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, totally. that's really the way it is, because you're in, you know, your adrenaline is up, your, um, I mean, I didn't mean to make it sound like I can't learn a song, you know, in 10 minutes, I, I can but it's just not necessarily gonna be played the way I will play it at the end of that tour when I've lived with it for, you know, six, seven months and had to, to, you know, get all the juice out of it in front of an audience every night. By that time, it's, it's, it's a living thing and it's doing its own thing. But, uh, but your, your adrenaline's up, you're in the studio, you're under pressure, you're, you're just, uh, flying by the seat of your pants and in that state things can be a blur you know it's it's like when you know an accident happens and you just react and someone says what happened you're like i can't even remember so uh talking about you know playing these things live um have you ever had anything go wrong on stage that you've had to recover from that you can tell us about oh god <laughs> Yeah, I had a really, really, I mean, I cringe to think about it. It's, uh, 
when I play, I usually play with uh, backing tracks. And this started with Bowie and has pretty much continued ever since. There's very few gigs that I do where there aren't backing tracks involved. So I'll, I was doing a tour with Zucchero in Italy. And in order to do it correctly, I like to have my own mixer. And this way I can adjust my own level of where the snare is, where the kick is in relation to the click and in relation to the rest of the band and in relation to the loops that you're having to, you know, marry with. And for some reason, my uh, mixer was set up in a way so that if you hit the wrong switch, and this, I don't know why it happened, but everything just suddenly distorted and got super loud. And I was playing and, you know, the keyboard player started to play something and it was like too loud. And I was like, I thought I had that turned down. And I reached over to hit mute on his channel <laughs> and I hit the wrong button and everything just suddenly was like blasting in my headphones and distorting. And I had to just, my reaction was to flip the headphones off. Oh, so you had over ears on rather than in ears. Yeah, because at this time I was having a little problem with my ears and I couldn't put anything in them, the oh, doctor that's said. That, that's lucky that you could take them off easily. <laughs> Not really, because what happened was I'm playing and all of a sudden the band looks at me like, what are you doing? And I realized I'm hearing the echo coming back in the arena and I'm way out of time. And even the singer's turning around like, what the F just happened? And I'm, I'm, I don't, I'm just like, ah, I don't know what to do. And the bass player starts, you know, jumping up and down on the beat so I could see what the tempo was. And I'm trying to follow him and ignore my ears, which are hearing the music, but in the totally wrong way. And it was just like, it was a nightmare. <laughs> uh, see all this technology. I, I use, I do exactly the same. I like to be in control of everything. And uh, my current band, by the way, is a uh, Led Zeppelin and Deep Purple tribute act in the UK. So, uh, you know what you said. Oh, about Led Zeppelin. Oh, fun. Yeah. Um, but um, I have a digital mixer on, on an iPad. And uh, yeah, like uh, something went horribly wrong with one of the other instruments and loads of feedback. I went to turn it down. I looked at my iPad and it was like, no internet connection. And I'm like, oh my God, like, and, like, it wouldn't do anything. And I'm like, what am I meant to do? I can't change. So I think, yeah, a proper like manual mixer is definitely the way forward. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But just make sure it's properly programmed because. <laughs> yeah, don't press the wrong pedal. Um, now, moving away from drums for a minute, I've got a couple of curveball questions for you, Zach. So the first one of these is Great. What are your hobbies away from drums? What do you like doing when you're not playing? Um, I like uh, drawing, actually. Cool. Yeah, I, uh, I, I spend a lot of time working on uh, what I hope to be a graphic novel. Oh, cool. Uh, because, you know, I was, I was a comics fan when I was a kid and, and I love uh, that style of illustration. And so, a few years ago, I bought myself um, a manga software and a tablet, Wacom tablet. And um, yeah, I just love to just delve into the world of graphic illustration. You know, it's totally different. It's completely different. There's no audience. There's no adrenaline. But it's the opposite. You kind of melt. It's like you get to melt, excuse me, you get to melt into this virtual world. And I say virtual because even, even if you're not using digital stuff, it's like you're looking at this blank page and you're trying to create a space within it that's not real. Uh, and um, that's something that I try to devote, you know, at least a few days a week to and uh, my next curveball question, uh, probably the most important question of this interview, what's your favorite cookie? 
my favorite cookie. Oh, well, those would be uh, the chocolate chip banana cookies that my wife makes. Oh, okay. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. We're in a lot of home cooking going on here yeah. from uh, everyone in the family, actually. Yeah, same here. We're doing loads of baking with uh, my little boy and stuff. When you say banana, though, is it like banana chunks or is it like like banana bread kind of like where it's mushed up? It's more banana breadish. Yeah, it's mashed up and uh, mixed in and, and it puffs up. So it's, it's a cookie, but it's also very light and airy. So it's, uh, they're, 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 they're kind of bready in a way, but more, uh, so hard to describe, somewhere between bread and cake, but it's a cookie. And, and because it's a cookie, the next part of that question is, would you dunk it? I see, uh, I believe you're drinking tea there. Maybe, yeah. Maybe you're a tea drinker rather than a coffee drinker. Would you That's correct. <laughs> would you dunk yeah. it in your tea? Uh, I've never, no, no, I don't dunk it. No? No. You could, but... Um, I've never wanted to, to wet them for some reason. I've dumped other cookies, but these, no, there's something about the consistency they have that I just enjoy that. Maybe I'll try dunking it. Maybe, maybe you got, maybe you're onto something there and I'll, yeah, let me I've been, I've been missing out. <laughs> okay. So uh, on to my final, uh, more serious question here. So if you could give just one bit of advice to up and coming drummers, many people that are just starting out with drums, what would that advice be? Uh, well, you know, that's a hard one because everybody needs different, different, different uh, advice. But something that I definitely um, am paying a lot of attention these days to is relaxing. Now, people have always told me I look so relaxed when I play, uh, and I am, but, but I'm trying to get even way more relaxed because uh, one of the things that, that keeps inspiring me is how many different ways you can play the drums. And when I started playing, I like to hit really hard and, and I like to play really loud and, um, you know, as Charlie Drayton would say, it's loud for a reason. And that reason was, was the sound you get and, and the power you feel. And also um, actually connecting to the room you're playing. Uh, and I was playing lots of big rooms, you know? I, I stopped playing clubs pretty early on. And whenever I would have to go back in a club, like if David would decide he wanted to do a club tour segment or if Hote decides he wants to do a club tour segment. It's always a real challenge to play the club because you're used to playing so loud. And it's a physical release and it's just, it's this almost cathartic experience. It's, it's just great on so many levels. But um, what I find now is that there's a whole nother way to play the drum, uh, which is when you play it really soft, you can get a very different sound from the instrument. Uh, in fact, a whole range of sounds open up when you play it soft. And you can explore those different sounds and those different tones. And um, that requires that, that you really, really relax. The only way to do that is to relax. And the more of a complex pattern you're playing, the harder it is to relax because you're demanding that your muscles do a lot, but you want it to feel as if you're doing nothing. That's when I say relax, I mean like no effort, zero effort. And uh, I'm having so much fun exploring this way of playing where the sticks kind of play themselves. And you have to figure out how can I use as little muscle as possible to get the sticks to do the most that they can do. And it's the same with the foot. Uh, you know, I, I, I prided myself at having a big heavy foot where I was using the whole leg 
And now, you know, I'm exploring just using uh, the leg in a different way where it's totally relaxed and there's almost no effort and you're getting accurate um, articulated hits out of it. And so this, so, so I, th I think the earlier you start learning to play relaxed, the better, because you can always turn the energy up, you know, and increase the, uh, the, the pressure. Um, but you really want to control it. I kind of look at it as like, if, if you spent your whole life practicing karate and then suddenly someone introduces you to Tai Chi, that's the way I look at it. You're, you're, dispersing the energy through your body in a completely different way. You know, you're not, it's a totally different mechanic from slamming the drum. You're, uh, you're using a whole different, uh, you know, mechanism with, with the angles of your wrist and your elbow and your shoulder and relaxing through your back and making sure your neck is not tight and breathing and, you know, it's a funny thing. The more you relax, it's almost like the more you can feel. Uh, you know, your internal organs are involved too, especially depending on how you're, you're, you're shifting your, uh, and twisting your body. Your, your, your organs are feeling that. So your spleen, your kidney, your lungs, your heart, everything is getting, getting a little massage. And uh, you want to you wanna try and keep those energy flows clear and going through all that. Um, and it's great because you can see the drummers who, who know this when you watch them play and it's like, it looks like magic, you know? I mean, I love the power of slamming the drums, but um, I've also discovered and learned to love just uh, letting almost, you know, the, playing the drums with no effort. Mm. I love that answer because, uh... It's a bit long-winded, sorry. <laughs> no, no, it's great. And I, I love it because so often, you know, when I'm teaching sort of fairly new drummers or whatever, I have to say to them, obviously, you know, we're not talking about like relaxing in, in the same way, I think, when they're, when they're that early on, but relaxing just about not playing like this, you know, and like tensing right up and, you know, mm -hmm. um, just, yeah, just like, just letting yourself just be free. And I, I always say, you know, you watch the great, some, some great drummers. Do they make it look really hard or do they make it look really easy? And, you know, it's, it's exactly what you're just saying. You know, someone that's mm -hmm. just like awesome will, uh, will make it look super easy. And that's because they're so relaxed with it. Um, yeah. So, yeah, love that answer. Good stuff. It helps your timing as well. Zach, thank you so much for spending your time with us at Drumwise today. It's been an absolute pleasure talking with you. Tom, it's been my pleasure. And uh, let's do it again.